Here we go. Let's talk about breaking barriers and attracting young families. In just a moment, Dan Cook, our founder, is going to talk to you about Not Your Parents Church and about the millennial generation and things that we have to think about in this future about being relevant and be able to build a church today that our children and our grandchildren want to go to even after we're long and gone. So let's talk about some barriers. First of all, you have to clearly identify and communicate your unique vision. I know that we use the terms mission and vision interchangeably a lot of times. But I want to tell you that if you don't understand or can clearly communicate what your vision is, it's going to be very difficult for the people of your church to have buy-in to what that vision is well. So how do we find out what our unique vision is? What are we known for? Vision is the unique fulfillment of what I call the five-fold mission of your local church within your community. I know we have a diversity of denominations represented here today. That doesn't bother me at all. Because what I know is at the core of every one of our fellowships here today, whether you are a denomination or an independent, at the core of our existence, there are five reasons why every church should exist. They're not on the outline. You might want to put them off to the side. But five reasons that ought to be every church's reasons for being. Number one is evangelism. We exist to seek and save the lost. We ought to exist to bring people into fellowship with Christ. Number two is discipleship. To take those new converts and to bring them into a mature relationship with Christ where they are a devoted follower of the Lord Jesus Christ submitted to His Lordship. Thirdly is Christian fellowship. I believe we ought to create a community of environment where people come together, encourage one another, pray for one another, build one another up through Christian fellowship, a community of caring. Number four, I believe we exist to be a place of corporate worship where believers could come together and worship God in one mind, in one accord, one heart, in one spirit, bringing glory and honor to God. If we are the body and He is the head, what greater way can we glorify God than to come together in harmony and unity as believers in the body of Christ to worship God? And fifthly is Christian service. That our assignment is not complete with just getting people to come to church and raise their hands and sing and clap. Our job is to make sure that every person identifies their special gifting and role in the body of Christ and fulfills that. That's the mission. That works for anybody. But the unique way in which that mission is fulfilled in Shawnee, Oklahoma City, Lawton, or any of the other communities around that are represented here today, whether it's inner city, rural, whether it's uh, uptown or downtown, the way it fleshes out within the context of your community is going to be what's unique about you. Do you know there are certain churches that immediately when you say them, you identify their uniqueness? There are churches that have the Christian schools. When somebody says, hey, do you have a Christian school? Or where, which church, where do I go to, have, uh, to take my kids to a Christian school? You know the Christian churches in your, church, in your town that have Christian schools. If, if you're looking for one that maybe has a dynamic youth group and you hope that yours is that one, but many times there's a church in town that seems to own that city, especially in smaller towns, that seems to have the, the going youth group in town. So what you have to do is you have to find out what is your signature piece? How are you known or identified in your community? Hopefully, you're not known by the two preachers who lost their marriages, a school that closed down, and an evangelist that killed that lady in the altar. But hopefully, you have a better identity than that, that, that we had to work on. We had to work on what is our unique identity, and how are we going to come across? Our unique identity becomes the fact that we are a multi-ethnic church, that we are a church planning church. We have a lot of different unique pieces about us. Another thing that sometimes people find a little controversial but I feel very passionate about is that the vision of the church and the identity of the pastor has to somehow become synonymous. That when you speak about the church, they think about the pastor or the leadership. When you think about the pastor, they think about the church. Whenever I think about Tommy Barnett in Phoenix, Arizona, I think about the Phoenix First Assembly as a great soul winning church in that area. If I say Phoenix First Assembly, I think about Tommy Barnett. When I think about different churches across America and begin to identify them, when I say Bill Bright, then you think about Campus Crusade for Christ. When I say Campus Crusade for Christ, you think about Bill Bright. We also talk about the three colors of vision. I don't know if any of you have been introduced to uh, the Natural Church Development, Christian Swartz, but he's a great writer, great communicator. Uh, he's written a lot of great materials. He wrote a, a, a piece called The Three Colors of Ministry. After I read the article on the three colors of ministry, I became convinced that there was an application to vision. And I discovered this principle, and this principle has helped me be the most effective vision caster I think I could have ever been in my ministry by learning the principles of the three colors of vision. I'm going to share them with you as quickly as I possibly can. The concept behind the three colors of vision simply says that people, people in our churches basically represent a color, and that most of our congregation consists of one of these three colors, or a mixture of these three colors, red, green, and blue. They attach those three colors to the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
In this case, we would ascribe the green color to God the Father. Now, we understand that they're three in one and they're all equally God. I'm not trying to demean that in any way, but we do believe that they have independent roles, that the Father has a role, the Son has a role, and the Holy Spirit has a role. So I'm talking about the roles of each of them. And in Scripture, we often see the role of the Father as kind of being the architect of the master plan, that God created the plan for redemption, that God sent His Son, that God is kind of the one. In some of our great theological worship hymns of days gone by, we'd often talk about how that God created the majesty of the universe. And so God is seen as the architect, the mastermind, the, 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 the intellectual center, if I can use it in that way, of, of the Godhead orchestrating the master plan. Green people are, are people who view things purely from an intellectual, analytical approach. Intellectual, analytical. So that anytime you endeavor to do something, they want the facts. They want the nuts and bolts about it. Remember when Jesus was about to feed 5,000 people? Immediately somebody stepped up and said, do you know how much that's going to cost? That was the green guy in the room. He was the number cruncher going down the road and said, do you know how much that's going to cost? And there are green people. In fact, there are denominations that are predominantly green. That doesn't mean they don't have any red or any blue in them, but there are denominations that the majority of their constituents are green people, high-level thinkers, very analytical approach. I could talk about Presbyterians, Episcopalians, people that often have in their constituents a lot of doctors, a lot of lawyers, a lot of high-thinking, high-level intellectual. They approach God from a reasoning, intellectual approach of, of being. It doesn't mean you can't have a doctor in a Pentecostal church or a Baptist church. I'm just saying, by and large, you look across the nation and you will see higher level thinking people in maybe churches that reflect that kind of approach in their worship. Very liturgical, very high thought provoking, high teaching levels. Well, the red represents Jesus. Jesus is kind of the missional person of the Trinity. He left heaven, took on earthly robes of humanity, came down, rolled up his sleeves, got down and dirty, and he became very missional about reaching the lost. There are churches that are very red. They have the outreach oriented. They're, they're knocking on doors. They're doing community canvassing. They have the, they have the food pantries. They have uh, any kind of an outreach oriented focus. They have the clothing rooms. They're, they're very missional in their design. They, they're willing to leave comforts to go do something significant in terms of outreach and impact in the community. And then there are people who are blue. And blue people are associated with the Holy Spirit. And, and blue people are, they have a little bit more leaning to the, to the areas of prayer and intercession. And uh, when you ask them about a decision, they'll say, get back with me. I need to pray about that for about 40 days and 40 nights, and then I'll let you know. You know, because they can't make a quick decision. You know, you see somebody down here on the street corner, that's, uh, that's that uh, situation that needs a family that's maybe their house is burned and they need help. You know, the green person saying, well, how much will it cost and how much do we need to raise and how many offerings do we need to receive? And the red person says, shucks, man, I'm going to go to my house, get some clothes out and get some food out of my pantry. I'm taking it down there to them. And the blue person saying, well, we need to pray for that family and we need to be praying about this and we'll see how we're going to respond in a few days. They're a little slower to move because they're bathing things in prayer. They take a little bit more time. In your congregation, all three of these colors exist. Now here, I want to tell you that, that even though I, I like to think analytically and, and intellectually, and even though I like to pray about things, I'm probably more dominant red. I'm very outreach oriented. Those of you that know our church knows that we do lots of different outreach functions in our city. When I first started leading vision in our church, when I stood up in the pulpit to cast vision, I cast it from my red perspective. Friends, we got to do this. We got to get down. We got to get dirty. We got to do what Jesus did. And I preached everything from a red tent of view. And so what was my green people doing? They're saying, do you know how much it's going to cost to feed 5,000 people? Do you know how much 5,000 backpacks cost? Do you know how my, how are we going to get that many volunteers to do all that? They're, they're number crunching over here. And the blue people saying, we need to pray about that and see if that's God's will, whether or not we should really help that many people at this time in this kind of an economy. And, and they're praying about it. So when I discovered that I had three pieces out there, I learned to change the way I cast vision. So now every message that I preach Every message that I preach, I make sure there's something in there for the green people, something in there for the red people, and something in there for the blue people. Something that's thought-provoking, that appeals to those that are analytical and very highly intellectually driven. I have something in there that's passion-driven about rolling up our sleeves, making a difference. I preach about something that involves, you know, about the Spirit of God. What's going to happen, the spiritual impact that this is going to have in the lives of people. If I was opening up a brand new youth camp and I wanted to raise support across the, uh, uh, our state for a brand new youth camp, 
then, then I would make sure I had all three colors in my presentation. I'd say, this is how many square foot it is. This is how much it's going to cost. These are the dollars and cents of it. And then I would go back and I would say, you know, this is going to be the difference that we're going to be able to make. We're going to be able to take kids and, and, and who are maybe don't ever get to go to church and their families will send them to summer camp. And we'll be able to introduce them to Christ. We'll be able to introduce them to a, a life with Jesus Christ. We're going to be able to open up to underprivileged kids and kids that are struggling and blended family kids. And we're going to be able to minister to them. And when they get there, we're going to be able to pray and the blue side is going to come out of me. And I'm going to say, who knows, some of these young boys and girls are going to come out and one day they're going to be our pastors and one day they're going to be our missionaries and one day they're going to be our evangelists. So what I've done is I've given something red, green, and blue to everybody. Now, I know we have new technology today, but when I grew up in the 60s, I was born in 1960, and I remember about 1965, my parents brought home the first color television in our home. And I remember that first color television, if any of you probably had that experience, you remember that the behind the television, there was three color tubes, a red, green, and a blue tube. And, and you could play with the hue and the contrast of the color to get the exact picture and the tint that you wanted. But if one of those color tubes went out, like the red tube, everything on the screen was green-blue because you didn't have a red tube. And you could play with the dials all you wanted to, but until you got all three of those colors in there, you weren't going to have a clear picture. That's what happens in vision casting. If there's a color missing from your vision casting, you're going to discover that you're not getting a clear picture. You notice when those are laid over black, which is the absence of color, when you extract blue, extract red, and extract uh, the green, in the very center you have white. That becomes clarity of vision. You know you have clarity when you have the overlapping of red, green, and blue concepts in your preaching, your teaching, or in your vision casting resources. People are visually stimulated. They need to have tools that, that you're casting vision with. I, I, I jokingly say, and I hope I don't offend anybody, I, I, this is just the way I kind of process certain things. You remember the story of Jacob and Laban where he was going to work for seven years and get Rachel and got Leah and worked another seven years and got Rachel and then he wanted to leave and his father-in-law said, you can't leave because I've been blessed ever since you've been here. And he says, well, what would it take to keep you? He said, well, I need to have my own herd. I need to stop my own posterity of family and my future. And he says, well, how in the world can you start your own herd? How will we ever know whose is whose? And he said, well, I'll take all the spotted ones and all the ring strength ones and all the blemished ones and you can have all the purebreds and there's a story behind that but I won't go into it. So he takes what's considered to be a lower class breed. The ones that don't bring as much money at the marketplace. He takes the ring strength, the spotted and the speckled ones. But notice that God gave him a strategy. He told him to take sticks and paint them white and put them out among the herds. Now I have to be honest with you, I do not know what it is about white painted sticks that made his sheep feel really, really interested in having sex and reproducing very rapidly, but something visually stimulated them because those sticks caused them to reproduce more rapidly than Laban's herd of the purebreds. There's something visually. When you go into a restaurant, the menu is not just words, it's pictures because we are visually stimulated. So if you're going to cast vision effectively, you not only got to keep out the three colors, you got to put some visuals in front of them. This is where we're going. This is what we're trying to accomplish. This is the difference we're trying to make. When you're calculating vision, you need to think about the fact that vision has to be not only about um, maybe projects, but about how and how many different people will be impacted by what you're about to do. People don't get excited about attendance goals. We're trying to reach 1,000 people. We're trying to reach 500 people in attendance. They don't get, a, they don't get motivated by that. What people do get motivated by is how many people is your church going to impact this week, next week, and the week after with the gospel. So we focus on impact numbers, and, and I believe impact numbers are important. Here's what I've discovered in coaching over 20 years. I've discovered that most churches have an impact capacity that's 10 times larger than your current attendance. If you're a church of 100, right now within your congregation, you have the ability to impact 1,000 people. When we were a church of 500, we launched a program called Feeding 5,000, which was 10 times larger than our congregation. And we began to impact those people on a regular basis 